Good morning, everyone. Junior Church, you are dismissed. I hope you were enjoying that little song um, that by Zach Williams just a little bit ago. I had somebody lean over and said, you know what, we should just listen to this. <laughs> yeah, I think they were saying, ah, let's not hear you today. No. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what God is like? What does he look like? What are his characteristics? If you were going to draw a picture of him, what, what would you draw? Mankind has asked this questions for millennia. God is powerful. He created the universe. He, he can send down lightning bolts. So at times God is angry. He, does he like to judge people and punish people? Some people have said that God is distant. If you see him, you die. They, they say he lives far away in heaven where you can never touch him or he can come to you. Some people say God is love, but he must also be hate because he sends people to hell if they don't like him. There are all these misconceptions and some truths mixed in and, and it's all jumbled together. So what is God really like? I think one of the best ways to find answers is to ask kids. Kids are simple, they are truthful usually, and their, their curiosity is awesome. Here are some excerpts of what kids say God is like. And these are true, not made up. I bet it, they said this to him in letters, I bet it's very hard for you to love all, love all of everybody in the world. There's only four people in my family and I can never do it. <laughs> Um, Donna said, we read Thomas Edison made light, but in Sunday school they said you did it, so I bet he stole your idea. In Sunday school they told us what you do. Who does it when you're on vacation? <laughs> what, Jane? Are you really invisible or is that just a trick? What does it mean you are a jealous God? I thought you had everything. It rained for our whole vacation, and is my father mad? He said some things about you that people are not supposed to say, but I hope you won't hurt him anyway. Your friend, but I'm not going to tell you who I am. <laughs> the, these are thoughts that people have, and the really interesting thing is those thoughts of who we see God just grow a little bit in us, and yet sometimes we still feel, oh my goodness, I can't believe she said that, God. I better move over in case there's a lightning strike. You know, people still think that. So what is God like? Can we ever truly know Him this side of the grave? And the answer is, I believe yes. I think Jesus Christ went out of His way to show us what God is like and how we can come to know God. In the second half of chapter 6 of Luke, Jesus actually tells us what God is like by showing us what a person modeled after God's heart will look like. So if you and I want to be authentic disciples, if we want to have an authentic faith, we need to look more and more like Him. And the only way we can do that is by getting to know Him. Do you remember the teacher's pet in school? How many of you, honestly, were a teacher's pet? Hot oh, Trina, yes, uh, <laughs> she still is. <laughs> you were? Okay, Croc, why didn't you raise your hand? <laughs> yeah, there was, there's certain kids, okay, there, there's two types of teacher's pets, okay? The one kid who did anything just to get approval from the teacher, and then usually when that teacher would leave, they would gloat and parade around because they had the teacher's approval. That was one. Then there's the other students that just love their teacher. They love learning. They wanted to follow. They wanted to learn from them. These were the students that went extra mile. They did the extra credit because they wanted to, just so they could keep growing in knowledge. And those are a teacher's pet. Many Christians think they are their teacher's pet, meaning Jesus. Because they attend church. Because somehow they're better than everyone else. They're that first style of teacher's pet. Well, I'm better because, you know, I put a few bucks in. I, I went to church and I actually know where my Bible is. 
But then there's the other style. They just want to get to know him. They want to learn from him. They want to grow from him. See, that first type give a black eye to authentic disciples. A great scholar once asked about a young man who was in his class. The person said, so-and-so tells me that he's one of your students. And the smile or the, the professor smiled and sadly said, well, he may have attended my lectures, but he's not one of my students. He attends, but he's not learning. And how many times do people attend church? Put my time in, check. But they haven't learned. This scholar was saying that the student showed up for class, but he wasn't really there. He didn't really take the teacher's um, classes seriously. He wasn't there to learn. He was there just to get the grade. Look what it says, Jesus says in Luke 640, students are not greater than their teachers, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. I I just got to read that again. Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. In other words, a true disciple, an authentic person of faith, isn't someone who shows up for class. They're not there just to put their time. An authentic disciple is someone who wants to be like their teacher. And our teacher is not Donnie. Our teacher is not the elders. Our teacher is Jesus Christ. And so a true student will want to come and be closer and more and more like him. And Jesus just said, if you're a good student, you will become like your teacher. Don't you want to be like Jesus? I mean, not just wear the 90s bracelet, but like he was saying, actually live it so that you're so much more closer to the likeness of Christ. See, these authentic disciples, they are someone who soak up everything they can learn because they want to please their instructor. An authentic disciple is someone that you might call the teacher's pet in faith. I looked up the term teacher's pet online, and this is one of the definitions. And teacher's pet is a student in class who is liked best by the teacher and therefore treated better than other students. Now, according to this definition, I want to be Jesus' teacher's pet. I really do. I have a friend from another state that she gave me this little coaster, and it says, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. Don't, shouldn't we all want to be able to say that? That Jesus loves you, but man, I'm his favorite. And not meaning it in a gloating, superior, arrogant way, but man, I'm just so close to him, and he, he's just here. I hear him. I see him. I, I know his word. I want him to like me best. Do you? Don't you want Jesus to say that he's up there in heaven and don't you want him to just go say, hey God, look, that's one of my favorites right there. Watch them. They're going to make you so proud. This passage gives us the key to pleasing Jesus and becoming more and more like him in our life. In fact, God says he looks I don't know what I did. In fact, um, the Bible says that God looks for people to be his teacher's pets. Look what it says, 2 Chronicles 16. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He is searching for people who have devoted their hearts completely to him, and he strengthens them. He's really saying, you're my favorite. Here's some strength. Keep going. God isn't looking for the smartest kid in class. He isn't looking for those who want to be the arrogant teacher's pets. But he's looking for men and women whose hearts are committed to him. And when he finds them, he's going to bestow upon them his strength. How many of you need his strength to face the day? How many of you need his strength just to get through the week? He just told you how to get it. So yes, I do want to be Jesus' 
teacher's pet. And in this passage, Jesus is going to tell us how to do that. The only way to do that is to get to know God, get to know His heart, get to know His character, so that we can become more like Him. There are a few things we need to learn if we're going to please Jesus. And here's the first one, Luke 6, 37. Don't judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will come back against you. Forgive others, and it will be forgiven. And you will be forgiven. There are a lot of people out there. Okay, a lot of people out there who think that Jesus is saying something in this passage that he is not saying. There are folks who are often involved with a lifestyle, a certain practice. They condemn, they are condemned in scripture and they know it. They get drunk down at the bar. They'll be sleeping with that person or this person. They'll be involved in different acts of immoral lifestyles. They cuss like sailors. And then they'll tell you, Jesus said, don't judge me. You can't judge me. And that is not, that is not what Jesus said here. On the internet, there's all these memes. And if you want to igno- um, just annoy some teenagers, call them maymays. They just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but on there is one that says, don't judge, you're not perfect. And I've seen this online several times. And this is what this meme says. That one. I'll live as I please and you have no right to tell me I'm wrong because you're not perfect either. I can do anything I want and you can't say a word about it. Because you're faulty too. Now I know this is going to sound kind of harsh. And I don't want to be harsh, but you know that I... I am blunt, okay? I don't like to sugarcoat things unless it's in my coffee or my cookies. Okay, so I don't want to sugarcoat this words. I want to say the truth. So hear the truth of this statement. And if if it offends you, it's not me saying it. I'm just repeating what God is saying here. So hear the truth of this statement. Most of the people that say those statements are hypocrites. You can't judge me because you're not perfect. They'll point their fingers and say that. First, they're saying, you can't pass judgment on me because you are imperfect. They just judged you. You can't judge me. You're not perfect. So who just judged someone as being not perfect? They pass judgment on you. They're saying that you're not perfect. Second, these folks will often judge others, saying, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. So I can't judge you, but you can judge everybody else. They point to your imperfection. They point to other people that they believe they are better than. Many Christians um, will talk about a practice as church discipline or excommunication or shunning. In Scripture, there actually is talk of when it's proper to kick someone out of the church. We don't like to talk about it because that's kind of mean. But it's in the Bible, and so it's proper. So when a Christian confronts somebody in sin, and that other Christian refuses to change, and they keep throwing it back in their face, and and if you go through the proper steps, and finally it said, look, this is what Scripture says to do, to live, to be, and you're not doing it, so why are you coming? You're against everything in here, so quit causing division. If you want to be a part of this, we need to stand together in this. I'll just tell you right now, if you want to be a part of my family, you cannot hate my wife. You can't. I will not tolerate that. If you want to be a part of my family, you have to honor her as she deserves. Otherwise, you're out. Doesn't seem that fair, or it doesn't seem that bad, does it? Same thing in the church. If you want to be in God's family, you need to honor him the way he deserves. And if not, why are you here? I I had a lady argue about this with me once. She was highly offended about this shunning, she called it, that would take place in church. She complained that churches were supposed to be a place of love and acceptance, and it's hypocritical for Christians to shut people off like that. 
Eventually that discussion ended and about a half hour later she's telling me about someone she disliked, one of her friends, and she wasn't ever going to let that person back in her house. She was shunning them. Don't judge me because you're not perfect. This is why I say that statement is usually made by hypocrites. Third, these folks will often quote Jesus, but they don't care about anything else he says. They don't want to live the way Jesus would want them. They just want you to quit pointing out where they already know they're wrong. Who likes to be told you're wrong? Nobody. And if you can find a loophole to try and shove it in someone's face that they can't tell you, you're going to. Teenagers and kids do it all the time. Go ask their teachers. Well, you didn't say I had to turn it in at the beginning of class. I just had to turn it in today. So, you know, 3, 14 or whatever it is, I put it in. They find these, the Brock's over here. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. So they don't want you telling they're wrong. When Jesus is talking about passing judgment, he wasn't saying you shouldn't say something is wrong. In fact, look what else Jesus says. So if we're going to take one statement of Jesus, we have to take them all. And Jesus says in John 7, 24, Do not judge by appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Wait. So I am to judge. Not by based what you look like. Thankfully, you can't judge me that way either. But I can judge, and you can judge based on righteous judgment. We all make judgments every day. Everybody has standards of morality and they, they make their decisions repeatedly based on what they have judged, right or wrong. They repeatedly decide what these are like and then they act on them. Christians are commanded to make those judgments based on Him. As a Christian, I need to know what I should not be doing and help others avoid doing those as well. Look what it says, Ephesians 4. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. Notice all the judgment in here. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against them. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and are eagerly practicing every kind of impurity. And you need to know what those are so that you can proclaim the judgment that that action is wrong. It's wrong. It is wrong to kick your neighbor. That's a judgment. It's wrong. Don't kick. It is wrong to bite. How many times have you told that to a toddler? That's a judgment. We need to make... I just saw some moms go, yeah, I need to tell them again. On top of that, think of it this way. Okay? How much do you have to hate someone to not tell them that their lifestyle is going to take them to hell? How much do you need to hate them to say, I don't care if you're going to hell, so I'm going to be silent? How much more love is it to say, look, I don't want you to go there. This is wrong. So please stop. See, the world tells you that it's hate that tells that I'm doing when I say quit sinning. But it's actually love. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't. I don't want anyone in here to go to hell. So stop sinning. And you need to tell me the same thing. We need to judge on righteous judges and say quit sinning. Don't do these things. It's when we quit talking about it that we are expressing Hate. So what Jesus is talking about when he says not to judge or condemn, well, he's telling us, guess what? You're not God. That may be a shocker to some of you. You're not God. And you don't know the eternal destination of a, of a person. So while you can judge in action, you cannot condemn the person. I have no right to look at you and say, you're going to hell. I pronounce it, it's done, it's finalized. I don't have that authority. I don't have that privilege or that right. I can say, don't do this, because that will lead you to hell. I can say, don't do these things, because they are wrong. But I can't say with authority, you are going to hell. 
You guys are all stone faced. Would you start shaking your head? Yes, please. Because I, I, thank you. I need to go to the same class that Andrew went to. So to cast, we can't do that. If we want to be like Jesus, we cannot condemn others. We do need to start judging what's right and wrong. We can point things out based on what God has already proclaimed. How many times do we do this? We, um, I, well, I'm, I'm just going to be a little open and honest here, okay? I took the boys to get their haircuts this last week, and behind the counter was this person with a ponytail and f- uh, fake press-on nails and makeup and earrings and girls' shoes, but it was not a girl. It, it was a guy who was dressed up. And the first thought that came to my mind, I'll just be honest, is, oh, I want to go to a different place now. I don't want to deal with this. I don't, want, I don't want to deal with this. That was the first thought, and I'm sitting there on my phone trying to distract myself so that I'm not looking at this person going, oh. And so I distracted myself. I thought, oh, I'll read my scripture. Oh, man. I judged him. I condemned him. And it was so wrong. Just by his appearance. I played God, and right there I sinned. And Jesus said, avoid that. Was that person doing something wrong? Yes. But that person is still someone who God loves. Instead of condemning them, I should have extended a hand of friendship, of fellowship, of something other than a pointed finger. Because they still have a chance to change their life because they're not dead. They're not dead, so guess what? There's still hope. And so instead of me pointing a finger and judging them in a condemnation way, I could have done something so much better. Your preacher failed at whatever hair place that was. And I need to do better. That's my little thing there okay max lucato says be careful the simon peter who denies jesus at tonight's fire may proclaim him with fire at tomorrow's pentecost the samson who is blind and weak today may use his final strength to level the pillars of godlessness the stuttering shepherd in this generation might be the moses of the next be careful not to condemn them because god is not done with them he is going to give them an opportunity And as I've been told before, I would rather give a hand of fellowship to somebody God has condemned than to condemn somebody God has given a hand of fellowship to. We need to be this voice of joy and love and saying, here, come into the family. These people aren't dead. Luke 6, 37 again, don't judge others. You will not be judged. Don't condemn others or it will come back against you. And then he says, forgive others and you will be forgiven. Notice the absolute statement. This is a command. It's imperative here. If you want to be forgiven, you forgive. Your forgiveness is tied to how much you forgive others. In Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Pray like this, he said. Now, uh, real quick, he's not saying pray this exact prayer. Okay, it's not this is the perfect prayer. He's saying this is the attitude and the ways in which you should pray. So our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. There's a lot of times that the translation will say, those who are debtors. But the translation really should say, those who we have sinned against or have sinned against us. In case you miss the connection, he says, let us forgive them as much as you have forgiven us. In case you missed the connection, Jesus completes this teaching in chapter 6 of Matthew. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you, your sins. 
If we want to be like Jesus, if we want to have an authentic faith, if we want to get to know God, we have got to forgive. Otherwise, we won't be forgiven. And this is hard. It took me close to 20-some years to forgive someone in my past. It is not something that you just turn on. Okay, I forgive everybody. It takes time. It is a journey. And the more we get to know God, the more we become like Him. And then the more we can learn to do this. Why is it so important to Jesus? Why did He stress this so heavily? Because He wants us to get to know Him. He wants to be a part of our lives. And this is what Jesus did for us. He forgave us. He gave His life to forgive our sins. In fact, if you remember one of the last phrases Jesus said on the cross, Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. While dying on the cross, He forgave me and you. Do forgive. To be like Him. In 638, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. So the amount you're forgiven is how much your forgiveness you give. If you want to be like Jesus, you have to give. So you have to forgive, you have to give. Now here's something I want to hit today. A lot of people think this is talk about giving money. Oh great, the preacher's talking about money again. This passage has nothing to do with money. They think this is about giving your gifts or, or stuff to the church, but I am convinced that's not what this passage, this passage is not talking about, well, you need to give your time to the church. You need to give your time to ministries and missions. That is not what this is talking about. This whole passage, this whole section is talking about how we deal with people we don't like. And to those people, you need to give. I don't want to. I don't like them. So I don't want to give to them. He says, don't condemn them, forgive them. And without taking a breath, he says, and then give to them. But give to who? Look what it says, verse 35. Love your enemies. Same passage. Do good to them. Lend. Give to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for He is kind to those who are, unthink to those who are unthankful and wicked. Give to the people you can't stand. No more is this tested than when you have a bad waitress or waiter. I, I'll just tell you right now, if they don't bring me drinks, because I'll drink five or six glasses of water, and if they don't keep that full... I, <laughs> she was my waitress a couple of times. <laughs> and I was sitting there going, Ashley! No, I didn't do that. <laughs> I forgot about that. Thank you. Yeah, pull that knife back out. Okay. We need to make sure that even when we don't get the drink we think we need right then, what kind of life are they living this day? What if they've had terrible news and they're trying to deal with a loss or a struggle and because they're so consumed on that they forgot to get Donnie his water. Maybe they're covering an extra shift because somebody else had to leave because of something. And they're doing their best to cover two things. And here I am over here going, maybe I need to give. Even when I don't like it. Did God give you grace? Was it because you deserved it? Did God give you mercy because you earned it? Did God give you forgiveness because you are worthy? We don't deserve any of those things, and yet God gave. And Scripture says He gave while you were His enemies. When you were against Him, He still gave. 
And now that we have become children of God, God expects us to love our enemies and give to them. But I don't want to. Can't you see the little toddler? I don't want to. I don't want to give things to my enemies. I don't like them. And I certainly don't want to share anything with them. I mean, why waste the good stuff on bad people? Why waste the good stuff on those who are just going to ignore it or abuse it? Well, let's look what Jesus says. Verse 38. Give and you'll receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Have you ever shaken a can of pop? You say, yeah, Josh had, and then he gave it to his dad, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you shake it up real bad, and then what happens when you open it? Hey, wow, got sound effects. It, it explodes over, and it spills onto everything. When we give in God's name... To those that we may not like, when we give, his blessings hit inside us and explode out. And we still have a full cup. That's the problem with the pop can. It's half empty. But when we do this in God's way, all those blessings pour out. They hit everybody around me. And then I look down and my cup is still full. My lap's wet. The people around me have been blessed, but my cup is still full. And we forget this all because we gave. In his name, he will make your cup run over. He will give you so many blessings that you can't contain it, and it will spill on to everyone. Have you ever known somebody who just being around them was a blessing to you? Was it because they gave? They gave to people. They gave grace. They gave mercy. They gave love. They gave attention. They gave happiness. They gave joy. And because of that, God kept filling them up. It's when we try to cover and keep it. And it just goes away. Last year, when we went through the book of Romans, learning how to be real disciples of Jesus, we saw the same idea in Romans 12, 20. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. I want to heap the burning coals. Right? Don't, oh, I want to give that coal and just rub it into their scalp. But how do we do it? give that's how you do it aren't you glad God didn't heap burning coals right on you at first and shove it down into you instead he gave you a way to heaven if you'd accept it aren't you glad he gave you grace mercy and forgiveness and when we get to know God when we grow to become more and more like him our teacher will also give to those who have hurt us. I, I think one of the best people ever to, to show this is moms. How many times has a kid hurt their mother's heart? How many times has a kid said something, done something, and what does the mom still do? Laundry, dishes, feeds them, clothes them, takes care of them, loves them. So let's be more like our moms, as our moms are being more like Jesus. Jesus said, don't judge, don't condemn, but do forgive, do give. And then he sums this all up. I'm going to read a big passage here. Jesus gave the following illustration. Can a blind person lead another? These are a little sarcastic here. Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes. And grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. Notice the repeating. And an evil produ person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. 
These are all things that I really felt like God is just, feel that, Donnie? There you go. Let, let me just burn this in a little bit more. Jesus is saying, if you sit around complaining about somebody, how somebody has mistreated you, and then you react to that person by being all mad and spiteful towards them, you'll start talking mean about them. And if that's how you're going to act, then you are a bad tree. It doesn't matter how many times you've come to church. It doesn't matter how many times you've read scripture. If you're being spiteful, mean, and arrogant towards somebody, you're a bad tree. And a bad tree is worthless. It says figs, fruit, are not gathered from a thorn bush. How many of you have ever been pricked by a thorn bush? Did you enjoy it? Weren't you just sitting there, oh, let's do it again. No, you hate it. You want to go cut the thing apart and rip it out so that it's not there to bug you again. What do you think Jesus is saying? If you are a thorn bush, if you are there just causing pain and problems on people, he wants to cut it out because it's leading to death. We can become that thorn bush. We can become that kind of worthlessness, that thorn-ridden plant, if we allow ourselves to look on our enemies in arrogance, in condemnation, and we start rotting on the inside. And then you end up bearing the same kind of fruit as that person who offended you. It says out of the abundance of hate, anger, bitterness, that's what's going to well up out of your mouth. There are people sitting in this room in, right now who have bad words coming out of their mouth. That's what you've stored up in your heart. That's what Jesus said, not me. When you start speaking bad things, it's because you have treasured them in your heart. I'll tell you this, my grandma never cussed that I know of. Because from the time I knew her, she'd already gotten past all that. And she became a good, God-fearing woman. And she never spoke mean things. When she didn't like somebody, I'm going to pray for you. And then she did. When she was mad at me, Donnie, and, and I do this because that's what she did. She put her hands, Donnie, I think you need to pray. And in my mind, I thought, she's going to kill me. But in her heart, she started treasuring godly things, and so they didn't come out of her mouth. How many times have we slipped in saying something? That's because we stored it in our heart. When we start saying negative things, that you're worthless, that you're horrible, that's because we stored that in our heart. And Jesus, the one who knows our hearts, looks at us and says, but you could be so much more. I see you as a jewel. I see you as tremendously precious in my kingdom because he doesn't store the evil in there. He's gotten rid of it. And he wants us to be like him, like his teacher, like our teacher. When we have a conflict with somebody, we usually see that 95% of the fault is theirs. Sure, 5% is mine, okay? But 95%, they're in the wrong. And you know what they see? They see 5% as their fault. Well, one of us is wrong. The other person sees the exact same thing. They see the log in our eyes. Have you ever had something that just covered your eye and you couldn't see? I, I had a helmet that I made one time, a bike helmet, and it had a 2 by 4 that stuck out of it. I did. It stuck out six feet. And I strapped it on, and then I asked a guy to come up front at that church and say, can I get something off your head? I can't even reach him. And when I turned my head, he was ducking because I was hitting him. And it looked doofy. When we have sin in our lives, and we come up and say, let me fix this in yours. And they could see the sin. They can see the hate, the anger, the bitterness, the arrogance. Why would they ever listen to us about a speck when we obviously have this big problem? Instead, repent of your, your problem. Repent of it. Get rid of it. Quit storing up evil in your heart. Then when you say, hey, there's something in your eye. There's not a barrier. You can actually get close to them. And because they've seen how you've gotten rid of that in yours, they will trust you. 
There's a book called Invitation to Healing by Linda Elliott. And in this book, she says, when I was in my 20s, I was badly hurt by a neighbor. For months, I replayed the hurtful scene in my mind, talking about it often with my friend. How many of you can relate? You, you've been hurt and you just keep replaying it over and over in your mind. As I expressed my feelings over and over, my pain became deeper and more invasive. It was becoming a part of me. But one day as I was receiving, uh, reliving the scene again, my friend said, do you know we become like the people we think about most? Whoa. You start reliving the scene over and oh man, they hurt me and it hurt. And they just kept digging in. And the more you're thinking about them, the more you become like them. Linda said the Lord used that question as a wake-up call. She said, I had a choice to make. If I chose to look at Jesus and focus on Him, I could be transformed into His image to become like my teacher. Likewise, she said, if I continued to behold the image of my neighbor, I would be transformed into that. I told you it took 20-some years to forgive somebody. And the whole time in my head, I kept saying, I don't want to be like that. I hate that. I don't ever want to be like that. Looking back, wow, I was acting just like him so many times. Because what was I thinking on? So let me ask you, if you want to be a true, authentic disciple of Jesus, are you focusing on him so that you can become more like him? Are you getting to know God more and more? Because He is not an unknowable God. He is someone you can get to know. Or are you focused on your enemies? Are you focused on those who have hurt you? Are you modeling your life in the things of this world instead of looking at Him? Look at that phrase one more time. Do you know we become like the people we think about most? So who are you thinking about? That's the real simple question right now. Who are you thinking about? Because if you have all this anger, bitterness, rage inside you, who are you thinking about? If you have all these pain, the deep-seated resentment, who are you thinking about? Because there is somebody who is saying, come here, let me lift that off your shoulders. Start looking at me and following me, and I will give you a life abundant and free. Jesus is saying, come get to know me and I will give you real life. So who are you looking to? Well, that's the question. Do you want to get to know God? Then look to him. We're going to stand and sing a song and if you need to make that decision, won't you make that today as we sing? Okay. So some of these people are watching. They can't get out of their homes or where they are, uh, but they have said they love watching the... Yep, that means you. Come here. Yep. So um, they were talking to Bill and Becky, and Bill and Becky wanted to do something for this person, uh, Doris, right? And so what we're going to... Do you want to say what we're going to do, or do you want me to do it? So what we're going to do, since she watches every week, even though she can't be a part of the fellowship here, we want you to know, Doris, that you're part of our family. So if everybody would turn and say, Hi, Doris. Hi, Doris. We're glad you joined us each week, okay? So that's just another thing. Um, you're good friends with her. And so she was talking and she said, we need to do this. So troublemaker up here did it. <laughs> yes, yeah.